On this Friday night, four weeks after the horrific Humboldt crash, we hear from a woman who saw it happen. Kelsey Fiddler was in her car, stopped right at that intersection. In a CBC News exclusive, she tells us what she did to help plus her poignant plan to honor those killed. Also tonight, the U.S. president changes his story on Stormy again, why Donald Trump finds himself cleaning up after his lawyer and his defiant response to questions. This is The National. The crash shocked and saddened the entire country, but it tore a hole through a Saskatchewan community with the sudden loss of so many associated with the Humboldt Broncos. The devastating collision with a transport truck killed 16 people on the team's bus, injuring 13 more. It was an unimaginable event. But tonight, as Humboldt continues to slowly heal, you'll hear from someone for whom it was all too real. Kelsey Fiddler from Red Earth Cree Nation witnessed it firsthand. Kelsey was driving east when she reached that intersection. The truck approached, heading west. The Broncos bus appeared, driving north. Then it happened. She can't discuss the details of the collision due to the ongoing investigation, but she was able to tell our Olivia Stefanovic what she did that day and what has happened since. Her emotions are still so raw, trying to come to terms with the unthinkable. I always wonder why, why I was there. Kelsey Fiddler was waiting at the stop sign to let the bus carrying the humble Broncos pass. It happened so fast, uh, there was this crash. I immediately felt to move out of the way because we were just right there. I seen the crash, I, the, the bus and the semi were already in wreck. She says it sounded like an explosion. White debris from the bus rained down everywhere. I was shaking there. I was saying, Lord, Lord, Lord. And all I could think of was grab my phone and call 911 right away. And I told them that they need to get here. But she didn't want her sons to see the horrible scene. I knew they were looking back at and I made them promise me not to look. Blankets and pillows she had in the car were used to treat victims. Kelsey was 28 weeks pregnant, and most likely from the shock, she started having contractions, 20 minutes apart at first, then 10, five. Were you scared for your baby? Yes, I didn't want my baby to be born so early. But when paramedics noticed her condition, she refused to take up space in an ambulance. I'm okay, I can take myself to the hospital. Just go help those people there. They need you more than I do. Kelsey drove 20 minutes to the Nipawin Hospital, but luckily everything with her unborn baby was fine. That's when I started feeling that, that sorrow for them. You know, I just couldn't stop crying for them. Part of her attempt to come to terms with what she saw four weeks ago is trying to connect with the families. I want to be able to say, to hug the family and say sorry to them. She also wants their blessing because she'd like to name her newborn Humble. Because mm, it almost sounds like Humboldt. <laughs> Humboldt strong, you know. A way to honor new life after tragedy. Olivia Stefanovic, CBC News. Melford, Saskatchewan. Of the 13 crash survivors, four still remain in hospital in Saskatoon. The Saskatchewan Health Authority is not releasing any more information at this time to protect their privacy. But we can tell you that another survivor, you've seen him on this show, Ryan Stresnitsky, is continuing to recover in a Calgary hospital. He's still paralyzed from the chest down, but he remains optimistic about a future in Paralympic sledge hockey. There's a lot on our radar tonight. Out west, one of the world's most active volcanoes is erupting on Hawaii's Big Island tonight. Lava is pouring through forests and even threatening homes. Johanna Wagstaff will join us a little later with what could be next. And in just three years, Alberta's Premier Rachel Notley has received 11 death threats. We'll take you through new documents obtained by CBC News. First, though, to New Brunswick, where the St. John River is hitting unprecedented levels, the highest anybody has ever seen. And the time to evacuate is now. 
as they have been for days. Thousands of people along the southern part of the river, from Fredericton to St. John, are being asked to leave the flood zone. But many residents still won't budge. Am I satisfied with the amount of evacuation that's happened so far? Uh, I am satisfied that people are being informed, and I am uh, I'm hopeful that they are making the right decisions based on their individual circumstances. And those circumstances could change quickly. Today, the floodwaters in and around St. John smashed the record set back in 1973, and they still haven't peaked. We're expecting heavy rain in the area tonight. So the worst is yet to come, and not just flooding. Power, water, and sewage services could all be knocked out. Now, some people are leaving the flood zone, but as Kayla Hounsell found today, for one New Brunswick family, it wasn't easy. We spotted them from the road, a family pushing to dry land, a boat filled with their belongings. Even though I have the chest waders on, it's, uh, it's very cold. Um, just being up against you, and it, it kind of closes in on you. All this belongs to Morgan Wombold's dad. They're going back for another load, so we follow them on a neighbor's boat to get a closer look at the flooding. Every year this happens. It's, the house has never flooded. We've always just had a canoe to get to the house. Things have been fine, but this is the first time it's not been fine. This is the stretch of road they live on, many homes totally surrounded by water. So, oh, gee, it's not going to go that deep. It, it never crosses the road. But it did, and it filled the basement, too. And there's a door and some wood floating around. There's a couple desks floating in here. So they're packing another load to save what they can. That's all our pictures. Oh, we don't want to lose them. They fought to stay as long as they could, but... The forecasts are calling for the water to rise. It's still rising. I, uh, I've got no heat. I've got no way to cook. They know they can't take everything. Can we put that up high? They stack what they can to try to keep it all dry. I think that's it. Okay. We're out of here. They begin another journey through all that water. It's not an easy walk, moving debris out of their way as they go, clinging to the boat for stability, all the while passing signs of just how bad the flooding is in this neighborhood. They say they can either laugh or cry, so they choose to have some fun along the way. I'm going down to the river. I'm going to wash my soul again. Finally, they reach dry land. We're done. They're heading off to stay with family, but they'll be back to survey the situation hoping the water doesn't rise too much more. Kayla Hounsel, CBC News, Grand Bay Westfield, New Brunswick. <gasps> oh my God. So while some parts of the country deal with flooding today, in southern Ontario, including Toronto, it was the wind. About 200,000 people lost power. Flights were temporarily grounded at Pearson International Airport. Even riding the streetcar was a risk when a flying sign hit the wires on one route. And the danger wasn't just at ground level. Our own Neil Cooksall captured this massive crane spinning wildly dozens of stories up at a condo development. Not too far away, a chair, likely blown off someone's balcony, streaked through the air. We haven't heard about any injuries related to that, but we do know that one man died and another was seriously injured when a tree fell on them northwest of the city. Environment Canada says wind gusts hit speeds up to 110 kilometers an hour in some areas. The Premier of Alberta is trailed by security everywhere she goes, from her daily walk into the legislature to news conferences and town halls. Now, documents obtained by CBC News show why there is real concern, real cause for concern. At least 11 death threats have been made against Rachel Notley since she took office. Here are just a few examples. This September, this 2015 tweet, Really, you dumb cow, be careful, woman, or you'll be the first assassination in Alberta. Or this threat, directed at the premier and the finance minister, Line, you arrogant, worthless jerk-offs against a wall, and you know what's next, and I would be the first to pull the trigger. Then this chilling incident, an application to a funeral home in the premier's name for her own funeral. 
It's not clear who was behind those threats or if they ever faced any consequences. But we do know Notley is far from alone. As Rafi Bujikanyan explains, those who get the angry phone calls, the hateful emails and the vulgar tweets say it has to stop. A newspaper would not, on its pages, publish vile commentary. The revelations about Rachel Notley resonated across the political spectrum today. Female politicians essentially saying, me too. I get death threats, I get vile language, I get messages designed to make me want to go home and die. You know, I've received threats of sexual violence in my life and I get, you know, I would get gendered slurs more than my male colleagues were. The level of the attacks um, and often the violent nature of the attacks is totally unacceptable. Notley herself has been relatively quiet about the threats against her. Uh, talking about specific events as it relates to myself or our cabinet, that's uh, not a thing that we do. This political science professor says there are partisan politics at play in the threats against Notley, along with sexism and the prevalence of social media. In this case, I see the people who are engaged in this, not only are they upset that their team is not in government, but I think they've actually withdrawn their consent to be governed by a party that they don't like. In Alberta, there were signs of a mix of anger and sexism early in Notley's premiership. At this rally, chats imported from south of the border. But if that is the mild edge, the case of Joe Cox shows how dangerous things can get. The British MP was fatally shot and stabbed in 2016 by a far-right extremist. As for any solutions, Thomas thinks it may be good not to give these hateful messages too much of a microphone. Otherwise... I think it's a profound chilling effect for any woman who has political ambition. CBC reached out to the RCMP to get more information about the volume of threats made against Canadian politicians, but police said they are unable to compile that data today. Rafi Bujikanian, CBC News, Edmonton. Now, after seeing the CBC News reporting on those threats to Notley, Jason Kenney, the leader of Alberta's United Conservative Party, did tweet this. This is completely unacceptable. People should be able to step forward to serve their communities without fear of facing personal harm. And during a stop in Ontario, the Prime Minister was also asked if he was aware of the threats against Notley. Here's what he said. There are still uh, levels of harassment and, and uh, threats of violence and actual sexual violence in far too many workplaces, which is why we need to call this out. We need to continue to stand strongly and firmly against harassment, intimidation uh, and violence in the workplace, in our communities, in our homes. The Prime Minister knows firsthand about these kinds of risks. As you can imagine, last year a man was charged after both Trudeau and Notley were threatened on Twitter. A couple of months later, a Lethbridge woman was charged for uttering threats against his wife, Sophie Gregoire Trudeau. That charge was later withdrawn. And a woman in Kelowna was charged after threatening phone messages were left for former B.C. Premier Christy Clark during last year's election campaign. Well, now to the $130,000 question about Donald Trump and that hush money given to porn star Stormy Daniels. The answers are getting even messier, if that's possible, for the U.S. president. As the CBC's Keith Bogue tells us, today, Trump was contradicting what we heard yesterday from his own lawyer, former New York City Mayor Rudy Giuliani. He'll get his facts straight. He's a great guy. It's a strange day indeed that begins with the president explaining that his own lawyer doesn't really know what he's talking about. Rudy's great, but Rudy had just started, and he wasn't totally familiar with every, you know, with everything. The president was trying to clean up after this candid interview Rudy Giuliani gave to Fox News Wednesday when he answered a question about the $130,000 hush money paid to adult film star Stormy Daniels. So they funneled it through the law firm. Funnel through the law firm, and the president repaid it. That contradicted the president's claims made on Air Force One a couple of weeks ago that he didn't even know about the payment, let alone where the money for it came from. Do you know where he got the money to make that payment? No, I don't know. So, reporters asked Trump when and why did the story change? Mr. President, when did you change your story on Stormy? We're not changing any stories. All I'm telling you is that this country is right now running so smooth 
And to be bringing up that kind of crap and to be bringing up witch hunts all the time, that's all you want to talk about. You you're going to see, you excuse me, excuse me. You did not know no, but you have to, excuse me, you take a look at what I said. You go back and take a look. You'll see what I said. A little later, Giuliani issued his own clarification. He said that the money to Stormy Daniels was not an election expense and would have been paid to her even if Trump were not a candidate for president. So it wasn't a campaign finance law violation. Plus, he said, her story about having had sex with the president wasn't true. So, Andrew, it seems we're back to the point where Trump's position is that he didn't know his lawyer paid $130,000 to an adult film star to keep her quiet about something that supposedly never happened in the first place. Right, Keith. And uh, another development to talk about tonight. A judge in Virginia is accusing the Office of Special Counsel Robert Mueller of pursuing a fraud case against Trump's former campaign manager, Paul Manafort, as a means to a different end, getting to the president himself. Is that right? Yep, that's exactly right. And it's an, an extraordinary thing. The judge is essentially making the case that Trump himself has been making, that the charges against Paul Manafort are about financial crimes that have nothing to do with the investigation of Russian interference in the last election. He says that doesn't mean the case is illegitimate, but he is suggesting it's politically motivated. And, and so what could be the consequences of that? Well, Manafort's defense team is hoping the case will be thrown out, and maybe it will be, though. That seems unlikely. But even if it were thrown out, Manafort still faces similar charges in a Washington, D.C. court, which is beyond the reach of the Virginia judge. So it wouldn't be like a get-out-of-jail-free card for him. But it's still a great talking point for Trump. And so you can bet you'll be hearing about it a lot and for some time to come. Keith Bogue in Washington. Thanks. Thank you. Trump also made a pro-gun speech today, which you might have mistaken for a campaign stop. He did mention midterm elections at a convention for the National Rifle Association. You give your time, your energy, your vote, and your voice to stand strong for those sacred rights given to us by God, including the right to self-defense. Contrast that with what he said after the school shooting in Parkland, Florida, which sparked a national movement for gun control. You guys, half of you are so afraid of the NRA. There's nothing to be afraid of. And you know what? If they're not with you, we have to fight them every once in a while. That's okay. No fight today, though. Trump repeated his support for the idea of having armed security guards in schools and for teachers to carry concealed weapons. Still ahead tonight on The National, what started with one patient stepping forward with allegations now has an Ottawa doctor facing more than 90 charges of sexual assault and voyeurism. And a sex scandal has put this year's Nobel Prize for Literature on hold. We'll look at the fallout as the Me Too movement hits one of the world's most prestigious awards. But first, multiple earthquakes, an erupting volcano and rivers of lava have triggered a state of emergency on Hawaii. We could hear the lava exploding right, right from a house. Tonight on The National, we are tracking an emergency situation on Hawaii's Big Island. Not only is the Kilauea volcano erupting, just a few hours ago, the island was rocked by a powerful magnitude 6.9 earthquake. It's just the latest in a series of earthquakes this week, hundreds of them. But this one is the biggest yet, the biggest to shake the island since 1975, in fact. And it's a sign the situation overall is still very volatile. So check out this incredible video from a little earlier today. Lava still spewing from cracks in the road. This is almost a full day after the volcano started erupting. As of tonight, there are no reports of anyone being hurt, but more than 1,500 people have been forced to flee their homes, unsure of what they'll find when they return. Since it's right there behind our house, we could hear the, la the lava exploding right, right from a house. And so, you know, is a house going to still be there when we go back over there? I told my mother this morning to pack a bag and just in case it go bag. And I ran in, I grabbed the dogs, threw them in a crate, put them in the car. 
what my room just grabbed up armload of clothes and here we are. So far, two homes have been badly damaged, and officials say it could get worse as more lava outbreaks are possible. They're also warning about a dangerous gas, sulfur dioxide, seeping through cracks in the roads. It's pungent and it's toxic. Now, Johanna Wagstaff is our meteorologist, also a seismologist. And Joe, can you explain what's actually going on underground that's caused all of this to happen in the first place? Because we're not just seeing lava flow, we're seeing lava bubbling up to the surface in strange places. It's true, Andrew, because these new fissures that have opened up have actually opened up much farther to the east than the regular flow of lava. And I say regular because this part of the volcano has been erupting pretty steadily since the 80s. In fact, all of the Hawaiian Islands owe their existence to this upwelling of magma under the ocean floor. But about a week ago, we saw that main crater erupt. Following that, an increase in seismic activity, basically an earthquake swarm happening in this new area, indicating a, move, a movement of that magma. That's when residents noted cracks opening up on their streets. Sulfur dioxide levels started to increase. And finally this morning, actual eruptions, sort of a fountain-like eruptions in those new fissures, which are basically underground tubes connecting back to that main magma chamber under Underground. But we haven't seen eruptions in this part of the island since the 60s. So since then, a forest has regrown and new developments have been built. Right. And so once the lava is flowing, I mean, how do scientists look at what's happening and predict where it's all ultimately going to go or even how much of it will come out? Well, Andrew, it's a complicated uh, forecast, and, and scientists are monitoring uh, this very closely. Uh, they're learning as much as they can about these new fissures. These earthquakes that are still happening are actually helping us figure out uh, where that magma is going. We're also monitoring a deformation of the surface, again, to see where that magma is moving, and we're able to monitor those dangerous sulfur dioxide levels from space. But it's hard to say whether this lava flow will eventually cut off in a matter of weeks or if this becomes a new lava field for the indefinite future, Andrew. Yeah, and that would be a terrifying prospect, I suppose, especially for all those people who have homes in the area. Absolutely, yeah. Johanna Wagstaff, thanks so much. You're welcome. And we do have a lot more ahead tonight. Just two weeks now until the big wedding day and still so many questions. Will Megan have a maid of honor? Who will walk her down the aisle? We've got some answers direct from Kensington Palace. Will we get invited? No. But first, the <laughs> Me Too movement takes center stage. How playwrights are using theater to spark uh, a difficult conversation with teens. I guess I just had too much to drink and I don't really remember. So they think I... No, 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 I didn't tell them anything about us. He didn't know what was happening and she didn't know what was happening at the time. But like, he still should have like known that he's supposed to get her consent. A disgraced Ottawa doctor already charged with multiple counts of sexual assault is looking at more legal action tonight, a lot more. Police now say his alleged abuses may go back over some 30 years, and yet he was still practicing medicine until just recently. Catherine Cullen has more of the troubling details. Vincent Nadal has gone from trusted doctor to a man accused of assaulting dozens upon dozens of women. We believe that the victims span. We don't know when they um, specifically started, but we know they go back at least 27 years. When he appeared in this court by video link today, the Crown said the list of victims was so long they didn't have time to read the names out. I believe at this time, I just counted, we have 50 victims. Five zero. Five zero. And she says that number could grow. The um, lead investigator is still working diligently trying to identify additional victims. Another shocking number, Nadon faces a total of 94 charges, both of voyeurism and sexual assault. Nadon worked at this university clinic that's also open to the public. Concerns first came to light in January when a patient in her mid-20s said Nadon had filmed her without her consent. I think that that was, um, it was always brave for victims of this type of uh, crime to come forward and this is the victim that started this off and you can see by um, just one person coming forward what a difference it can make. Medical malpractice lawyer Paul Hart says this case highlights the importance of taking patients' complaints seriously. It's incredibly surprising, uh, especially the breadth of it. 
uh, how could it have gone on for so long and been undetected? Particularly where he's working in an institutional environment, and you would have thought that there'd be others around. The College of Physicians and Surgeons of Ontario is also investigating Nadal. In a statement, it says these charges contain very troubling allegations, saying it advocates for stricter penalties in cases of sexual abuse. Here at the clinic, the University of Ottawa Health Services says it's disturbed by the charges and has reached out to Nadal's former patients. Court conditions imposed in February prevent him from practicing medicine. And yesterday, he was arrested and remains in custody, waiting for a bail hearing. Catherine Cullen, CBC News, Ottawa. Well, the world's most prestigious literary award is in meltdown mode. The Swedish Academy is choosing not to present a Nobel Prize for Literature this year. Instead, it'll hand out two awards next year. All of this triggered by a sex abuse scandal. Last November, the husband of an Academy member was accused by 18 women of sexual misconduct. Some of the incidents even allegedly took place on Nobel properties. And the same man is also accused of leaking the names of Nobel winners. Infighting over the crisis has caused a number of people to just up and quit, leaving the Academy with too few members under its own rules. That's prompted a rare intervention by Sweden's king. And as Stephanie Skanderis reports, the Academy is now struggling to recover. The Nobel laureate in literature. It's just about as traditional a night as you can imagine. White tie, high brow, Nobel Prize ceremonies always bring the pomp and circumstance. But this year, the celebrations for literature are on hold. To me, is like, what took so long? As the jury chair of Canada's richest fiction prize, the Scotiabank Giller, Kamal al Suleili is watching closely. They're doing the right thing by just putting their house in order first and trying to clean up the mess that they have inherited from, um, from the current uh, people involved in it. Um, does it actually take away from previous winners? No, not, not really. But it's, you can go forward now that all this stuff is out in the open without doing some house cleaning first. That's exactly what the Swedish Academy says it's doing by taking a year off, something it hasn't done in almost seven decades. In a statement released today, the Swedish Academy says it needs time to regain its full complement, engage a larger number of active members, and regain confidence in its work. This gender studies professor says she's not surprised there are systemic problems. When you cull a whole bunch of people who have the ultimate kinds of power in society, when you make their positions uh, for life, so that regardless of their behavior, they still have that power. Whenever they're homosocial, meaning all one group, all one age, all one race, you know there's going to be an abuse of power. Taylor says it's not just the Nobel Prize for Literature that should be scrutinized. Just like review of the Academy Awards has happened, who is giving these awards and to whom? The same thing should happen for all other prestigious prizes. The Swedish Academy has one year to rebuild and consider its future. Stephanie Skanderis, CBC News, Toronto. Sexual misconduct allegations have also tarnished the reputation of American broadcaster Charlie Rose, and they're getting worse. Three women who worked with Rose have filed a lawsuit alleging predatory behavior and harassment. The Washington Post has reported that more than two dozen women have accused him of inappropriate conduct. CBS fired Rose in November, and his long-running PBS show was also cancelled. Well, Me Too and Time's Up have forced a re-examination of many entrenched institutions, like we were talking about there. But the movements are also about bringing these difficult conversations into the open in the hopes that things might be better for the next generation of women. And that's what two Canadian plays are trying to do, navigate that road of consent and sexuality, but to a teenage audience. Tashana Reed takes us on stage. Shut up! Shut up! Maya is actually wearing a bikini! It's amazing! <laughs> yes! Social media, underage drinking, swearing, and sex. This is Selfie, a play created for teens, running at Toronto's Young People's Theatre. Everybody's sweating. I love it! And I think I'm here, he's here. This time things are going to be different. It's a high school party fueled by alcohol and hormones. Longtime friends Chris and Emma have sex. 
The next day, she doesn't remember. Okay. Okay. Um, what happened at the party? We... Well, we danced and we... What do you mean? I don't remember. The Stop issue is consent. Did okay, she give I, it or is this rape? Powerful questions for the teen audience to grapple with. Oh my God. It's okay. It's gonna be okay. I guess I just had too much to drink and I don't really remember. So they think I... No, 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 I didn't tell them anything about us. Nice. For Vancouver playwright Christine Quintana, it wasn't about creating villains. It was about writing characters teens can relate to. I got to talk to some students after the matinee today and they said that they had never had education about consent that entertained the idea that there isn't necessarily violent intent right away and that that left some space for them to enter the conversation being like, well, I'm a good person, but I could still hurt somebody. The actors on stage say theater provides a different level of interaction that helps push this conversation even further. Because they're right there and it's so close and intimate, the space, they watch us go through it as if we're right next to them and as mm -hmm. if we're like one of their peers. It leaves you, the end of the play, having so many questions and so much to discuss. And I really, really like that. And I've never seen anything uh, written like that, especially for teens before. Just give me a one word reaction. Yeah. Amazing. Amazing. Thank you. That's awesome. Uh, yeah. Shocking. Shocking. Yeah. Damn. Damn. <laughs> After every performance, the teens have an opportunity to discuss the issues in a question and answer session. These students from Market Lane Public School had lots to say. He, he didn't know what was happening and she didn't know what was happening at the time, but like he still should have like known that he's supposed to get her consent. I think this is really like emotional, like even during the play I was getting emotional because it was really touching and good. Selfie isn't the only Canadian theatre production sparking a conversation among teens. After a successful run in the UK, the award-winning play Girls Like That made its debut on a Toronto stage earlier this month. A photo of Scarlett naked! A naked photo of Scarlett goes viral. The story is told from the perspective of the girls in her class who bully and taunt her. Slut whore! But that's not the boys. That's what's weirdest. Canadian-British playwright Evan Placey wrote the play after talking with young women about the issues they face. I've had young people say, you know, um, thank you, that's what happened to me. And it was really hard to watch, but um, you captured it really well in giving voice to that and recognizing what had, had happened to some of these um, uh, young women. Both productions aim to have the audience question what role they might play in these kinds of situations. And so to create a scenario that would allow students and educators and adults to see themselves in that scenario and say, well, what's my responsibility? What do, what do I need to be looking to myself to do to keep myself and other people safe? We're starting the conversation and that's what's really important. And hopefully, you know, I'm remaining optimistic, that will evolve into action. Raise your hand. The hope, yes. these kids will take what they've learned with them. Tashana Reed, CBC News, Toronto. Ahead on the national as big grocery chains race for online shoppers, there's one Canadian company betting big on sticking to the basics, smart or short-sighted. I think a lot of grocery chains didn't change fast enough and they're really on their heels now and we see weakness and we want to we want to pounce on it. To not have a service that they want and they're used to for other products is incredibly dangerous. You're really handing that part of the business, that millennial customer to other folks. But first, we want to tell you about a special series you'll see here starting next week. We're going to be telling the stories of young Canadians facing immense obstacles in the midst of life changes. On Monday, you'll meet Stefan Alexis. The 24-year-old has put his hopes and dreams on hold to help his parents care for his younger brother, who has cerebral palsy. When people think about a caregiver, they generally think about a female. It's a very easy um, assumption to make and a very easy picture to paint. Watching my dad taking care of Tor um, 
has impacted me in a pretty significant way because he's shown me the other side of masculinity. He teaches me how you're supposed to be attentive to certain things and how you're supposed to like take care of your family. Competition in Canada's grocery business has always been fierce, but when Amazon announced last summer it was buying Whole Foods and teased technologies like drone delivery and no cashier stores, it prompted all the big chains to start innovating their online services, except for one. Diane Buckner explains why Farm Boy is banking on brick and mortar. Hi, A chilly morning in a Toronto suburb. These are homemade. It's not even 8 a.m. on a weekday. But the lineup is growing. There's no MSG, no fillers, no artificial flavors. What can get Canadians out of bed so early? We are Farm Boy Incorporated. Not just free snacks. We've been waiting for this store to open for months. And we need the quality of the store yes. in our neighborhood. Looks like going to be nice. It's going to be interesting to see uh, all the goodies they have for, for sale. This is the grand opening of a new Farm Boy. Yay! It's headquartered in Ottawa with 26 stores around southern Ontario. Thank you very much. I'll take one of these. These shoppers won't find products such as laundry detergent or toothpaste in the aisles here. Farm Boy only sells food. We put in our whole own line of deli roasts with no nitrates. CEO Jeff York is gambling. Farm Boy's focus on foodies is a winning strategy in today's hyper-competitive grocery industry. I think food is very important to people now. It's just not go get cheap food and just use it as a, a means of existence. Food is actually very popular and you get the TV networks and things and the whole chef culture. And I think we're, we're riding a good wave right now. But can that wave carry the company's aggressive expansion plans? For years, Farm Boy locations could only be found clustered in small cities. The new plan calls for 15 to 30 store openings in the greater Toronto area over the next five years, and eventually a move into other provinces. Hard to make salads, really hard. No really cool ingredients. Foodies would like it, they see what's in it. With consumers' current cravings for fresh, locally sourced products, Jeff York believes Farm Boy is on top of the trend and in a better position than its competitors. I think a lot of grocery chains didn't change fast enough and they're really on their heels now. And we see weakness and we wanna, we wanna pounce on it. Your trip to the grocery store just got quicker. But look out, e-commerce juggernaut Amazon has set its sights on the grocery industry with its 2017 purchase of Whole Foods. When Amazon starts to roll out their Amazon Fresh, if they do, like they do in the U.S., and in some cities in the U.S., they're offering same-day delivery or one- to two-hour delivery, on fresh foods, that's going to be a game changer when that hits. Since Amazon's move, just about every big player in the Canadian grocery business has been scrambling to add online options. Loblaw's new service is up and running. Others have announced it's coming. So you're seeing an incredibly competitive environment. This environment retail consultant like wonders how long Farm Boy can buck the trend, especially with millennials. Um, to not have a service that they want and they're used to for other products is incredibly dangerous. You're really handing that part of the business, that millennial customer, to other folks. But Farm Boy is sticking to its roots. Since starting as a tiny fresh produce store in Cornwall, Ontario 36 years ago, founder Jean-Louis Belmar has always focused on food. Jeff York was hired to expand the company. He had previously taken discount chain Giant Tiger from a small regional player to a national chain of 240 stores. And York is not overly concerned about the race to get online to compete with Amazon. 88% of the business is not online. So I'd rather concentrate on the 88 than on the 2 to 12. And I think a lot of our competition are totally fixated on the 2 to 12. And we're concentrating on the 88. So that's why I sleep well. Do you ever shop online for groceries? Uh, don't really. We normally go to the shopping. No. 
I, I buy a lot of things that are, um, you know, not food online, but when it comes to food, not so much. No. 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 How come? Oh, we're all people. We're not, not too good about the computer. <laughs> We roast these in the stores every morning. York says Farm Boy will ramp up more online offerings eventually, but for now, he says being all over the top consumer trends guarantees strong business. Everyone else has really flat sales. They're complaining about a bad environment, and we're looking, for, we, can't, we can't find enough good locations right now. Still, Bruce Winder has a warning for Farm Boy. I wouldn't underestimate Loblaw. They might be big, but, uh, you know, they've shown in the past that elephants can dance and that they can do some very interesting things that are quite progressive, especially in trending and things like that. As the battle unfolds, shoppers may be the real winners as stores go all out to compete on service, selection and prices even before Amazon's invasion. You have a great day. Diane Buckner, CBC News, Toronto. Now, Farm Boy may actually be onto something because according to the market research firm NPD Group, uh, despite claims that online grocery shopping will almost triple by 2020, more than 70% of consumers surveyed say they don't plan on buying food over the internet at all. And there's more ahead tonight on The National. The moment is next. But before we get there, with just two weeks to go, we've got some new details for you tonight on The Royal Wedding. Kensington Palace confirmed both of Meghan Markle's parents, that's her mom there, will be part of the wedding. They'll arrive a few days early to have a private meeting with the royal family, including the Queen. Meghan's father, Thomas, will finally get to meet Harry in person. He'll also be walking his daughter down the aisle. And we're learning more about the bridal party. But if you were betting on Canadian Jessica Mulroney being Meghan's maid of honour, She's decided not to have a matron of honor or a maid of honor as, as we refer to them over here. I think that's because she has a lot of close friends, many of whom have been helping very quietly behind the scenes. And I think it was probably just too difficult for her to choose one. As for choosing bridesmaids, Meghan has opted to follow royal tradition and give those jobs to children. We don't know who yet. And finally, it's expected once Meghan and Harry are married, they will not be jetting off someplace romantic. This is a couple who have rolled up their sleeves and got down to serious work right since the day they got engaged. In fact, just a couple of days after they get married, that same week after the wedding, they are going to be carrying out an official engagement and putting their honeymoon on hold for a while. We'll have lots of special coverage from London leading up to the wedding and, of course, on the day of. Goes without saying, the National has her back for all of it. And if that's not enough, hey, why not get a special newsletter appropriately called The Royal Fascinator? Subscribe at cbc.ca slash Royal Fascinator. If you're an alien and are looking to relocate, I can find your terrestrial forever home. I'm Liz Klein, Earthling House Huntress. You are gonna love the next place. I just know it. When I get that feeling, I can't stick around before too long. Tonight on The National, some good news from the family of George H.W. Bush. A spokesperson says the former president has been released from hospital. Bush ended up in intensive care nearly two weeks ago after contracting an infection that spread to his blood. Now, though, he's said to be doing well and is happy to be returning home. We have an update for you now on a story we brought you last night. The Vancouver chiropractor who posted a video that seemed to be anti-vaccination, he's resigned from his position yourself from the flu is not a flu shot in our opinion but boosting your immune system and one of the ways to do that is uh, fresh smoothies and fresh juices that was avatar jassel in a video posted last november he resigned today as vice chair of bc's college of chiropractors the college says it's now looking for an independent investigator to look into his actions Part of a major BC highway is shut down north of Whistler tonight after an avalanche. These photos were taken earlier today at the scene. That's part of Highway 99, the Sea to Sky Highway, buried in snow. Officials say they're still working to clear the debris. They're hoping to have one lane back open to the public by tonight. And that's line towards center. Jackson's on the run. He's not getting back. 
And not a bad way for Jose Bautista to debut with his new team against a familiar opponent to boot. The former Toronto Blue Jays slugger played his first game tonight with the Atlanta Braves, but not before one final thank you to his former team and city. He posted a heartfelt letter online today calling his experience in Toronto magic. That's very classy. A Toronto teenager's high school graduation photo has gone viral. You'll see why. Kevin Kodra spent four hours doing his makeup for the photo. The result, over 22,000 likes on Instagram. But Kodra is also hoping to send a message, one he shared with CBC Toronto's afternoon radio show Here and Now. And that is our moment of the day. All my friends are like, you're Kevin Kodra, you have to wear makeup. It was like a really glamorous, bronzy, glowy, big lashes, uh, nude lip, like it's just very like red carpet makeup. I expected people to see the photo and react to it, but not to the degree it did. But when I woke up the next morning with 18,000 likes on my photo, it was different. The concept of like a man in makeup is not socially acceptable all the way yet. And that's what I'm trying to break down. I'm trying to break down that stigma and that social barrier. I want little guys and little girls to know that they don't have to be feminine or masculine. They can be whatever they want. So Kevin has uh, alluded to some of the reaction he's gotten. A lot of it's supportive and, and from where it counts too. His dad apparently very supportive, very encouraging. He's got a good group of guy friends at school, also supportive. And uh, two of them listened to his radio interview, a part of it that you just saw there. I want you to have a listen. And my best friends, Clevis and Willie, are oh! my Which, it's shocking for someone like me to be best friends with guys, for his father to be pushing him to succeed in makeup Mom, and Mom, wearing makeup it? in public. <laughs> everything about well, that <laughs> uh so he's actually gonna graduate from uh from high school next month and he wants to go on to university to do media arts or production but i would actually hire him personally because i don't you don't know this andrew but that level of contour that is real skill <laughs> is that is that uh, pro level that's yeah. like you know you lose 20 pounds just from makeup it's amazing See, i i, I prefer a more subtle look myself <laughs> for, for the program but, you're uh, a little more I, natural I no yeah. i'm gonna do that glamour <laughs> okay. on monday okay that's the national for may 4th good night good night <laughs>